Hi, I'm Emma Carroll. I'm the author of books like Secrets of a Sun King and Letters from a Lighthouse. But the book I'm going to be introducing you to today is my newest book, which is called The Week at World's End. And look at that for a shiny cover. I am so, so thrilled about that cover. But you're probably going to be wanting to know a bit more about what's inside the book. Um, let me just say that the cover is by a new illustrator called Daniela Terenzini who has also redesigned some of my older covers as well. So if you see those in the shop, we've got a new Frost Hollow Hall, a new Somerset Tsunami, and a new When We Were Warriors cover. So if you see those, you'll, you'll think, oh, that looks a bit different. That's because they've been repackaged and redesigned, and they look amazing. So have a, have a look if you see one. Okay, so those are the covers of, of these books. Um, but what's inside? Well... This is a story that is set in 1962. So that makes it probably my most modern story other than in Darkling Wood, which has some sort of modern day settings. And the story begins on Tuesday, the 23rd of October, 1962, which was when a particularly scary situation first became public. And this is a real, this is, this is true. This is, this is real life stuff. So what happened on that day was um, it was revealed to two people through the news and through uh, the president of America giving a speech that there was a situation developing off the coast of America around a, an island called Cuba. Now, Cuba is a communist country. And it, at that time, it was supported by the Soviet Union, who also were a communist um, regime. And there was what was called the Cold War going on, which was this kind of diplomatic sort of frostiness, that's putting it mildly, between America and the Soviet Union. Now, Cuba is just off the coast of Florida, so it's not actually very far away from America at all. And Cuba had started building weapons that they were pointing at American cities. So the problem had been brewing for, for a few days, but finally became public on this day. Now, the threat became a very big, scary standoff between these countries, so much so that there was a threat that World War Three was going to break out. Now, why have I set a story <laughs> during this time of thinking, what's, what's I got to do with us? Well, partly because this thing I've talked about called the Cold War was something that also went on when I was growing up. It rattled on through the 1980s, and there was always this fear in people's minds that there there could, I guess it still still is to an extent, that the next world war would be fought with nuclear weapons rather than what we call conventional weapons, so it would be much more devastating. Um, but my parents were teenagers during the Cuban Missile Crisis, as it was called, so in, 19, in that week in 1962 when this standoff was developing. And they told me about it and, and said, you know, how, how terrifying it was and how the newsreaders would come on air and sign off at the end of the bulletin by saying things like, we'll see you tomorrow night if we're still here. Things like that, which would, you know, would really have been quite, quite scary. Um, and people, you know, people were really, really affected by the possibility that this, this third world war might actually happen. So I thought, well, that would be a really interesting period of time to set a story in where we've got this big global situation that's really, really tense. But my characters have also got situations of their own that they've got to resolve. So what I've done is I've created um, a story that's set in a street that's very similar to the street my mum grew up in. And the house of one of my main characters is very similar to my mum's, my grandparents' house. So that was what I had in mind when I was writing um, that part of the story. And we have three children in our story who are the main characters. We have a girl called Stevie who tells the story. We have a boy called Ray who is her best friend. And Ray has um, parents that you may well have come across in some of my other books. Now, you don't have to have read my other books in order to read this one but if you have read Letters from the Lighthouse or you have read When We Were Warriors then the names of Ray's parents might be familiar to you that's all I'm saying okay so look out for that and these two friends um they're they're <laughs> They have quite a, quite a dull life, really. They're kind of on, they're hungry for adventure. They're hungry for something to happen in their kind of mundane school, paper round, hang out each other's houses kind of life. 
and that happens at the start of the book and the situation that develops for them on a very personal level unravels during the course of this very dramatic week now just to give you a flavour then of the story I'm going to read to you in a sec but it's a story about friendship mostly it's about these three friends and how they kind of try and change their lives they try and kind of change things they try and change things for the better and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't it's also about secrets that that families keep from each other that come out during the course of this week it's also about um, trying to change things on a bigger scale so not just it for your own family or for your own friendships but also for the world for society and how we kind of we can come together with people who are very very different from us if we've got a kind of a collective cause we've got a reason to want to kind of speak out and try and put things right because that's what a democracy is it's about people trying to change things that they're not happy about so there's a lot of that in the story as well okay um, and because it's in the 60s we've got reference to hairstyles and music and food that the people ate around that time we've also got reference to other news items that were going on at the time big big changes in america the civil rights movement happening martin luther king um, giving speeches we've got um, the space race you know the americans and the russians were also kind of in competition as to who was first going to put man on the moon so you've got a lot of a lot of things going on it's a really really interesting time in history to write about okay so chapter one chapter one begins on day one and the headline of this newspaper on the 23rd of october says u.s president warns cuba missiles could lead to war so this is when the story first breaks in the news and we realize that there is the possibility of a war developing tuesday the 23rd of october 1962 and this is what's happening in stevie's life this is a, a, a you know pretty standard evening in stevie's house it was after tea on a school night when i found the dead body i'd gone out to the shed to fill up the coal bucket which was as good an excuse as any to escape our kitchen for a moment's peace. Being a Tuesday, we'd just had pie and mash for tea. And being a day with a Y in it, my big sister Bev was arguing about why it wasn't her turn to do the dishes. Our terrier flea, an excellent listener, was waiting patiently for any leftover pie. And all Mum did was turn the radio up louder. It was that new Beatles song again, the one that went, Love, love me do which, with the clatter of plates and the smell of mashed potato, was giving me a bit of a headache. Outside, the evening was inky black. The air had a bite of frost to it, and the only sounds were the distant hum of cars and next door's water gurgling down the drain. I stood for a moment, enjoying how peaceful it was not to hear Bev yakking on, or the radio playing hit song after hit song, because Mum, who hated silence, had barely switched it off since Dad died. I went down the two steps to the shed and opened the door, only now switching on my torch. I was checking for spiders mostly, and certainly wasn't expecting anything else to appear in the torchlight. But it did. Something woolly and green. A bubble hat. I took a tiny step closer. My heart began to thunder. The hat was on a person's head. They were lying against the coal heap, facing the far wall. All I could see was the jut of a cheekbone, the coat collar turned up against the cold, a muddy hand that looked more like a freshly dug potato than anything human. The person wasn't moving. They were either very fast asleep or dead. I backed out of that shed faster than any spider could make me move, and with the door shut and bolted, I caught my breath. I tried to think. The sensible thing would be to go straight back inside and tell Mum who'd rush round to our next door neighbours and asked to use their telephone and call the police. But I'd never seen a dead body before. And I was curious for a look, just quickly, just to be sure, though I was far too scared to go back into the shed by myself. So I did the unsensible thing. I went across the street to my best friend Ray's. He'd never seen a dead body either, and I knew he'd be up for it, given half a chance. Okay, so that's just the very, very first couple of pages and what happens next changes their lives forever. So if you do come across the book, if you do get a chance to read it, I really hope you enjoy it um, and happy reading to you. Take care. Bye bye.